On June 1st, 2022, conservative commentator Matt Walsh released What is a Woman? a documentary that pokes fun at progressive gender ideology by showcasing its adherence, inability, and unwillingness to answer the simple question posed in the documentary's title. In interview after interview, Matt can be seen taking on a relaxed and unassuming demeanor as he calmly asks his subjects the most inoffensive and basic questions about their views on gender, only to be met with embarrassing outbursts of hostility, evasiveness, and in some cases, unrestrained retardation. Consider, for example, the following clip where Matt asked Dr. Michelle Forcier to explain the meaning of gender-affirming care as it relates to children and to then comment on the unreliability of a four-year-old's account of their own gender identity. So what is gender affirmation care you're a big proponent of? If we walk through, a child is sitting down with you, is questioning their gender. What's the gender affirmation process? Affirmation means that as a pediatrician, as someone who says my job is to provide the best medical care for you, is I need to listen really carefully. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? And more excitingly, where would you like to be in the future? Have you ever met a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? Mm Mm-hmm. So this is someone who believes that A fat man is traveling through the sky on a flying reindeer at lightning speed, coming down his chimney with presents. Yeah. Would you say that this is someone who maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality? They have an appropriate four-year-old handle on the reality that's very real for them. Agreed. Agreed. But Santa Claus is real for them, but Santa Claus is not actually real. Yeah, well, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. Well, yeah, but he's not real, though. To that child, they are. When I see a child who, you know, believes in Santa Claus, and then let's say this is a boy and he says, I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. This is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality. So how could you take that as a reality? I would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent, I would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is. To recapitulate what we just witnessed in that clip, Matt asked the blue-haired dipshit if four-year-olds could be trusted to interpret reality accurately. And rather than give the same response of, no, they're fucking four years old, the lady starts going on about Santa Claus being sort of real and how moved she is by four-year-olds' active imaginations. And she's making these statements in her capacity as a parent and pediatrician, which is to say someone who's entrusted with the responsibility of guiding a child through a life-altering medical procedure. Her eagerness to vouch for a four-year-old's account of reality betrays a shocking disregard for the due diligence required before one starts writing prescriptions and chopping some dicks off. And the fact that this kind of person is entrusted with the care of vulnerable and suggestible children says something very damning about the professional atmosphere in which she's allowed to have a reputation as a competent medical authority. In this next clip, Matt gets into a somewhat contentious exchange with a social scientist when he asks for some clarification on the interplay between sex and gender, and the social scientist takes issue with his line of questioning. We're talking about gender and and sex, and there's a lot of controversies there. If we're talking about a trans woman has all of the male physical characteristics, so would that not be a male then? Couldn't couldn't we plainly say this person is a male? Well, well, I guess it's it's like, why are you asking the question? I think I I want to understand sort of why that's so important. So if someone tells you... Just to sort of understand reality, you know? Well, I mean, I think when someone tells you who they are, you should believe them. So if a person says that they're a woman or they're a man, then that's them telling you their gender is. I'm I'm not so sure what what social... um, in- interactions would have to do with with maleness or femaleness that would well, be I'm not even talking about social context I'm just I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth you know Yeah I mean I'm really uncomfortable with that language of like g- getting to the truth again in social why, why life is that, why is that uncomfortable because that it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me um and the if truth? you and, and if you keep probing we're going to stop the interview I if I, I probe about what the truth is you keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying is, to you... How is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. What my truth is? Well, I don't think I really have a truth. I think that there's just 
the truth, like the reality. And so we should begin by trying to figure out what the reality is. Uh huh. And why are you concerned with when someone else tells you that they're a man, or even if they use the word male, why are you concerned with not believing them? Well, you keep bringing it back to, you know, how do you respond in a social situation? But, That's what I do. I'm a social scientist. Well, right. But we're in a university. This is a place of understanding truth, isn't it? Or Absolutely. We, are, we pursue truth, is, truth and so I'm a social scientist, and that's what I but do. But you just said the truth is transphobic. Matt just said a lot of things I strongly agree with in his response. We should want to be in contact with reality. There's only one objective reality, and people shouldn't be castigated for seeking the truth. The social scientist, by comparison, seems like he's full of shit. He's not being especially articulate, getting pissed at Matt for asking a question, and stubbornly refusing to engage with Matt's truth-seeking exercise almost like as if he's got something to hide. Everything he says gives the viewer the impression that he's never really grappled with common sense objections to his willingness to take people's testimony about who they are at face value, as Matt demonstrates in the rest of his response. Yeah, that's transphobic. No, no, yeah. I don't want to see anybody's genitalia. I, I, I just mean someone can make a statement about themselves that could be untrue. Like, for example, if I, if I were to say that I'm a black man, could you... Would you accept that or would you be skeptical? Are you black? Are you African-American? Are you biracial? I don't think so. Yeah, well, you don't look that and I don't think that's a, it doesn't sound like that's a genuine statement of who you are. Okay, so that's my point. I, I could make a statement about who I am that's incorrect. Of course, I think it's well established that human beings can lie, yes. Or not even lie, I mean, I could just be mistaken. Yeah. Now, setting the social scientists' incompetence and naivete to the side for a second, I'd like to stress the significance of what Matt just said about a person's failure to accurately describe themselves, because it's going to form the basis for much of what I have to say in the rest of this essay. Matt's position essentially boils down to the following four claims. One, the truth matters. Two, people can either lie or be mistaken about who they actually are. Three, a person's self-identification can't be the only warrant for the rest of us accepting the identity they're professing membership to. And four, our estimation of who a person is must be informed by objective facts about them. I wholeheartedly agree with all of these claims, and applaud Matt Walsh for having the courage to bring them to the fore in our increasingly divided cultural landscape. What's more, I find the mainstream media's attempts to dismiss his documentary as nothing more than a mean-spirited hit piece against trans people quite distasteful and intellectually dishonest, because throughout the documentary, all he's doing is addressing the fat-ass elephants in the room. He never gets loud or confrontational with any of his interviewees, or even especially critical of trans people. All he's doing is getting down to first principles to figure out what the hell is going on, and sharing the results of his investigation with the world to advance a vision of truth, justice, and moral clarity. And in keeping with this noble example, I would now like to share some of my own views on personal identity and the things we call each other, except instead of focusing on trans people, I'd like to focus on Trump supporters. A Trump supporter, in the most basic sense of the phrase, is a person who supports Donald Trump in one way or another. Perhaps they admire him for his wealth, or his showmanship, or his political strength. Maybe they see him as America's last bulwark against the global elites and woke mob who want the rest of us to suffer under their boot. Or maybe they just get a kick out of watching a dumb nigga talk of shit. Whatever the permutation of reasons undergirding their support for him may be, this is a contingent of people who feel that Donald Trump's strengths outweigh his flaws in such a way that it would be appropriate to have a favorable opinion of him. But as far as labels go, I think this one has virtually no descriptive utility, and therefore that it should be discarded. I think the term Trump supporter is a misleading euphemism which by virtue of Trump's association with past presidents like Obama and Bush and Clinton makes support for him seem more like support for your run-of-the-mill presidential candidate than for your once-in-a-lifetime aspiring autocrat. To illustrate the strangeness of this phraseology, imagine you meet someone at a party and you're getting along just fine and eventually the topic of conversation turns to politics. And then after you share your views on the economy and healthcare and immigration and the kind of role that you think government should play in people's private lives, you ask your new friend to describe their political orientation. And they go, oh me? I'm just like a, an Adolf supporter. You're an Adolf supporter? What's that? You mean like, like Hitler? Like 
Adolf Hitler? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one. Um, I'm just a really big fan of his work. Oh, okay, shit, my bad. I thought... I mean, I think it'd be helpful if next time you just said you were a Nazi. Because, uh, like, in my head, I was thinking, like, what the fuck is an Adolf? Who's, who's supporting Adolfs? Now, in an ideal world, where the labels we use communicate the most relevant information about the things we're referring to, this additional step of verification wouldn't need to take place, and I would immediately recognize the deeply harmful nature of my friend's political views. And upon criticizing him for holding said views, no one would be tempted to reprimand me by drawing an equivalence between Adolf Hitler and Angela Merkel, on the grounds that they're both former German heads of state who deserve our respect for their contributions to the German people. It would be universally acknowledged that morally speaking, Adolf Hitler and Angela Merkel exist in different worlds, and that any suggestion to the contrary can be taken as an admission of one's affinity for Nazism, antipathy for liberal democracy, or some combination of the two. But because we live in this world, where we are continually plagued with vapid and ethically confused appeals to civility, unity, and fairness, we're treated to spectacles like the following exchange between Piers Morgan and Destiny, in the aftermath of Destiny's flippant reaction to the death of a Trump supporter during the former president's assassination attempt. Uh, let me bring in Destiny, because uh, you've been at the centre, as you know, of a, a massive uh, online response to what you were saying. Uh, and I want to go through what you said, and I want to talk to you about this, in, in a, hopefully in a, in a calm manner, to try and understand what you were thinking. So on Saturday evening, hours after the shooting, you said, let me clarify, when I say conflicted, what I mean is I lean towards seeing it as a natural extension of the thing Trump and the MAGA kids support. So I don't think I have much sympathy about the attempt enough to chastise people celebrating it. You, you couldn't find it uh, in your heart to chastise people for celebrating the near assassination of, the, of a, a man who was president of the United States and maybe again? Absolutely not. Conservatives have completely bled that well dry. And the idea that they, after engaging in the most divisive and most extreme rhetoric that this country has seen in recent history, that they would come on and, and beg for sympathy, that it's escalated as some kind of violent confrontation, is absolutely insane. Even the idea right now of saying, well, if you call somebody a Nazi for so long, it's, you know, what do you expect people to do? I grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh call Obama a communist every single day he was on the radio. Um, you've got conservatives that talk about how the mRNA vaccine were ways to sneak microchips into us. You've got COVID lockdowns that were done because the government was trying to take all your freedom away. They won't acknowledge anything that happened on January 6th. Um, they say that the election was stolen and that your country is being taken from you. Like, I don't think anybody should be killed. I don't think anybody should go and kill anybody. But when you engage in this type of rhetoric and when you turn the temperature up over and over and over and over again, there is absolutely no room for but you, you to say, be shocked okay, or but you surprised. Say, and okay. there certainly isn't room for you to ask for sympathy. But you, say, you, but Destiny, you say you don't want anybody killed. And yet you say, I don't think I have much sympathy about the attempt to chastise people celebrating it. It's people celebrating the near assassination of Donald Trump, if you can't find it in you to chastise people who do that, aren't you just as despicable as the people you've just spent the last two minutes haranguing? What we just witnessed from peers was a masterclass in moral confusion, which I think is largely a product of the misleading terms that he's using to frame this issue. For instance, Consider the question Piers asked Destiny after reading his tweet to him. You, you couldn't find it uh, in your heart to chastise people for celebrating the near assassination of, the, of a, a man who was president of the United States and maybe again? First, it must be acknowledged that this question is quite gay. It's also quite retarded. To elucidate, the question is gay because it leverages emotionally charged language like the phrases couldn't find it in your heart, a man, and president of the United States to smuggle in concepts that don't belong in a fair-minded analysis of the issue at hand. Think of all the things that we would fault someone for not finding in their heart. Sorrow for a grieving mother. Compassion for a sick child. Concern for a wounded animal. In the same vein, think of examples of men. Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King Jr., Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, Bruce Lee. Lastly, think of presidents of the United States with a special emphasis on the assassinated and nearly assassinated. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, JFK, Ronald Reagan. As we can see from the conceptual tapestry woven by Pierce's question, he seems to think it appropriate for Trump to occupy a space in it, because in Pierre's mind, Trump is a blameless victim of circumstance, a man of great honor, integrity, and discipline, and a committed civil servant who did his best to serve his country. Needless to say, these are all frank delusions. 
Donald Trump is a lascivious con artist and fear-mongering jackass who attempted to usurp the will of the American people by subverting the outcome of an election that he lost. He's a morally bankrupt liar, pervert, bully, fraud, traitor, and enemy of the United States. Reasonable minds cannot disagree on any of these points. As for the retardation of Pierce's question, he seems to be implying that the mere fact of a person's proximity to national office is reason enough to feel bad that they got shot. Clearly, this is a ludicrous standard for being deserving of sympathy, because simply knowing that a person held national office tells you nothing about the kind of character they were before, during, and after their term in that office. To illustrate, consider Trump's remarks on the death of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS. Trump said of al-Baghdadi that he died like a coward and like a dog. He died like a dog. He died like a coward. The world is now a much safer place. And that's why he died like a dog. He died like a coward. He was whimpering, screaming, and crying. And frankly, I think it's something that should be brought out. Now think of just how grotesque and odd it would be if in the aftermath of Trump's announcement, as decent people around the world were celebrating the death of that terrorist, Peers were to try and claim the shakiest moral high ground ever by asking, how could you people celebrate the death of a man who was the president of ISIS? The man was a father, a husband, and a scholar. Factually speaking, Peers wouldn't be wrong. It's true to say that al-Baghdadi was all of those things, but to stress the importance of those aspects of his identity when he dies is to reveal one's ignorance of the man's greater political legacy and the things that he thought were worth living and fighting and dying for. In addition to being a father, a husband, and a scholar, the man was an architect of the Yazidi genocide, a serial rapist, a slave owner, a torturer, and a theocrat. His death need not have been an invitation to separate the art from the artist. And this practice of separating the art from the artist, and the fans of the art from the art, and the fans of the art from the artist, so that all we're left with is a disjointed suspension of paints and brushes and colors and, and niggas the fuck with the way some shit looks for no particular reason at all, is exactly what we're doing when we choose to call Trump supporters, Trump supporters, and treat them like they're just as normal and worthy of civil engagement as members of any other political movement. The label degrades our ability to speak clearly about the values and beliefs of the average Trump supporter, to identify the threat that those objects pose to the longevity of the United States, and to muster an appropriate emotional response whenever something bad happens to Trump or his confederates. Is the blemish on this person's face a tumor or a pimple? What about this one? Or this thing? Is this a birthmark or a melanoma? Whatever answers you gave to the questions I posed, I trust you understand that in a scenario where you are actually being relied on to make the right call, the accuracy of your speech matters and has significant implications for the lives of the patients under your care. You understand the danger of calling a tumor a pimple and would be appalled by any policy that perpetuates that category error at scale. And you'd be doubly appalled by a culture that insists on refusing to make distinctions between tumors and pimples, not based on any thoughtful study of the tumors and pimples that it can observe, but based on an a priori assumption that there are two sides to every issue, and so in principle, that tumors and pimples must have similar proclivities for bringing about human suffering. Whether you realize it or not, your life is a continuous exercise in distinguishing between tumors and pimples, and it would serve you well to use this heuristic to keep your head above the shit that pseudo-journalists and intellectuals keep flooding into the swamp that is our online media landscape. The tumor-pimple distinction rests on the following premises. Pimples are bad. Tumors are bad. One must carefully observe a pimple before declaring it a pimple. One must carefully observe a tumor before declaring it a tumor. Though they may seem similar, pimples and tumors are not similarly bad. Tumors are exceptionally worse than pimples. Anyone who baselessly insists that a pimple is really a tumor, or that a tumor is really a pimple, is either an idiot or an asshole, and should be treated as such. If you feel that someone has mistakenly categorized a tumor as a pimple, or a pimple as a tumor, the onus is on you to justify that view with reasons and evidence, so that the validity of your claim can be either accepted or rejected, and the rest of us can be better placed to understand the differences between tumors and pimples moving forward. Let us now use the tumor-pimple distinction to parse a talking point that has been endlessly circulated in response to the attempt on Trump's life, which is that if you spend eight years calling Trump Hitler, then you shouldn't be surprised when someone tries killing the guy because they think he's going to murder six million Jews. Trump isn't Hitler, and the left needs to calm the fuck down. In other words, 
If you spend eight years calling a pimple a tumor, then we shouldn't be surprised when someone tries to get rid of it with a scalpel. The implicit claim of this talking point is that any comparison between Trump and Hitler, or Trump and any other authoritarian figure, is nothing but a needlessly inflammatory expression of one's TDS, and therefore, that anyone who engages in such rhetoric is throwing their lot in with the blue-haired bitch that Matt was talking to earlier. More succinctly, Trump is a pimple, and any suggestion that he resembles a tumor should be dismissed out of hand as a confession of one's inability to form an objective and unbiased opinion on his character. Look, man, I hate being the cunty debate bro here, but this is just rank confirmation bias masquerading as an appeal to reasonable and fair-minded discourse. If you hold this position, you're essentially saying that anyone who would describe Trump as an authoritarian, fascist, autocrat, dictator, or threat to democracy, all of which are things that most normal people would agree are bad and wrong, must be mistaken because Trump is good and he can do no wrong. Trump's cum has intoxicated you so thoroughly that you now believe refusing to engage with historical analogies that paint him in an unflattering light is a marker of your intellectual rigor and objectivity. You're so drunk, you think you're sober. For an especially embarrassing display of this kind of gay self-deception, let us now consult Ben Shapiro's Trump is not Hitler, where he deals with the left's histrionics head on. Well, folks, Democrats believe they have the silver bullet against Donald Trump in 2024. And wait for it, wait for it, it's that he's Hitler. As I say, the Democratic proposal is that Donald Trump must lose because he's an authoritarian. And we don't like authoritarians, except for when Joe Biden is using his pen and his phone to try to mandate that 80 million people take a vaccination or lose their jobs. And then, then they like authoritarians. Or like when they try to just by dint of executive order, get rid of hundreds of billions of dollars in student loan debt. And then the Supreme Court says no. And then they do it anyway, which is the thing that's literally happening right now. They've still been dispersing funds. I'm not kidding. In violation of Supreme Court ruling. Doesn't matter. The real authoritarians are people like Donald Trump. Again, not, look at that truth social and tell me that what you're looking here is, what you're seeing here is a burgeoning Mussolini or Hitler. Look at his truth social. Dude doesn't know how to capitalize right, guys. He misspells basic words. Like, I, when he was president of the United States, his authoritarianism amounted to him saying things on Twitter that he then didn't do. But this is going to be their entire, like, no one thinks Donald Trump is this scary. Seriously. I, I'm sorry, like, even people who are, who are suggesting that January 6th, was a massive crisis level event for the problem. Not just an ugly, horrible thing that happened, which I agree, ugly, horrible, bad images of people storming the Capitol building, hurting police officers and all the rest. That was not an existential crisis for the United States, not remotely. It was a bunch of dolts and some people who were like in good faith there and wandering the halls who held up the procedure for like two hours. And then that was it. But they're still going with the Trump-Hitler thing here. The first two points which Ben raises have nothing to do with the claim of Trump being an authoritarian. They're cheap attempts to paint Democrats as hypocrites who don't actually care about authoritarianism. But even if that charge was true, it would have no bearing on Trump's purported authoritarianism. Joe Biden and the Democratic Party can be disingenuous assholes who excuse authoritarianism when it suits them, and Trump can still be an authoritarian. If you have two tumors situated right next to each other, the tumor on the left doesn't make the tumor on the right any less of a tumor. In point three, Ben cites Trump's inability to proofread his true social posts as evidence that Trump is too stupid to be an authoritarian, as if intelligence is a necessary precondition for being an authoritarian, which it isn't. We can take Hitler as a prime example. Hitler's commitment to killing the Jews at the scale that he was killing them at during World War II was objectively stupid from a military strategy point of view. Diverting trains and manpower and fuel to death camps when the allies are on your ass, instead of using that shit to push them back, was a fucking retarded decision by Hitler. And let's not forget that the Holocaust itself, as a policy for curing Germany's problems, was also fucking retarded. Morally, philosophically, and strategically speaking, Hitler wasn't as intelligent as this Jew would have us believe Trump needs to be in order to be considered a true authoritarian. It's totally possible to be a stupid and incompetent authoritarian, so Ben's rebuttal here is also invalid. Tumors come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and simply saying, you have to be this tall to be a real tumor, is not a wise formula for identifying them. Point four seems to imply that one's authoritarianism must be backed by action, and then plays fast and loose with the definition of not doing something without being specific about what supposedly authoritarian thing Trump said he'd do and then didn't do. Please take note of how vague this is. It's not an unambiguous spot the difference exercise between the definition of authoritarianism and Trump's actual behavior. It's just a giddy blur of 
Okay, well, he was kind of authoritarian on Twitter, but he didn't really keep that same energy when push came to shove, and I'm not going to say specifically what he was saying that fits that description, so, yeah, he, he's not an authoritarian. If we're going to criticize the left for erroneously calling a pimple a tumor, shouldn't we first clearly define the boundaries for what a tumor is so that we can point to how egregiously the left has failed to color inside the lines? I think so. So let's do that while we address the horseshit that Ben says in point five. An authoritarian is a person who favors or acts according to authoritarian principles. And what are authoritarian principles? According to Wikipedia, authoritarian principles include a rejection of political plurality, the use of strong central power to preserve the status quo, and reductions in democracy, separation of powers, civil liberties, and the rule of law. Unfortunately for the tendentious ass point Ben is trying to make, Trump is a dead ringer for someone who favors or acts according to these principles. And nowhere is this resemblance more readily apparent to anyone who doesn't have their head stuck up their ass than in Trump's conduct on January 6, 2021. Trump rejected the ideal of political pluralism by refusing to concede the results of an election that he lost, and failing to respect the will of the plurality of people who chose Joe Biden as their president. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Trump used strong central power in an attempt to preserve the status quo by leveraging his platform as president of the United States to invite thousands of his supporters to the Capitol to prevent the certification of election results. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Trump, who was the head of the executive branch at the time, violated the separation of powers by attempting to pressure Mike Pence into overturning the results of the election, when Pence was overseeing the counting of the electoral votes in his capacity as president of the Senate, which is part of the legislative branch. And he looked at Mike Pence, and I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. All he has to do, all he, this is, this is from the number one, or certainly one of the top, constitutional lawyers in our country. He has the absolute right to do it. We're supposed to protect our country, support our country, support our Constitution, and protect our Constitution. States want to revote. The states got defrauded. They were given false information. They voted on it. Now they want to recertify. They want it back. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify. And we become president, and you are the happiest people. Trump threatened civil liberties by impinging on lawmakers and police officers' right to security as they carried out their respective roles during the storming of the Capitol. He also tried to rob 81 million people of the civil right to vote and have their votes counted. Finally, Trump greatly diminished the rule of law by filing frivolous lawsuits to further his claims of election fraud, refusing to respect the authority of the courts that tossed every one of those cases, submitting fraudulent slates of electors to skew the electoral college results in his favor, inciting a mob to break into the Capitol and interrupt a government proceeding, and refusing to stop the violence for three hours while Rudy Giuliani made calls to lawmakers to convince them to delay the certification of the results. For all the reasons I've just mentioned, reasonable people are compelled to call Trump an authoritarian, and to wonder what fucking reality Ben Shapiro is living in that he can so smugly privilege his feelings over all of these facts. How on earth can the supposedly intelligent wonderkind of conservative media spend two years looking at the same tumor from every conceivable angle and still say it's a pimple? To solve this pressing mystery, we must now turn to the idiot asshole distinction. 
When you're judging anyone in life, your assessment of their behavior is mediated by your perception of their intentions and intelligence. Some people don't mean you any harm, but they're just so doggone stupid, clumsy, and forgetful that their actions are effectively indistinguishable from someone who's actively trying to fuck your shit up. We call such people idiots. We recognize that they may be good people deep down, while maintaining that their stupidity should preclude them from ever occupying any position of power or influence in society. On the other end of the spectrum, we have assholes, who start their day with bad intentions, and who may or may not have the intelligence required to realize their evil desires. So if we draw intelligence on the x-axis and intentions on the y, we get a nice Cartesian plane of culpability that we can use to make decisions about who to emulate and who to condemn. In quadrant one, we have Gandhi, MLK, Abe Lincoln, and Batman. Elmo, Michael Scott, and Forrest Gump in quadrant two, Tate and Trump in quadrant three, and Osama bin Laden, Hitler, and Stalin in quadrant four. Now while the idiot asshole distinction is great for achieving moral clarity about the various actors in our lives, it's a distinction without much of a difference at the level of making decisions about who we want to surround ourselves with and who we want to lead us. Quadrant one is where it's at, and once you absorb this fact, you will spare yourself a lifetime of agony in the domain of figuring out who to trust, love, and associate with. The mix that I've settled on, personally, is fuck everyone from quadrants three and four, enjoy the company of like 49% of the people in quadrant two, but don't trust them with anything important, and support, celebrate, and aggressively raise the profile of everyone in quadrant one. With this heuristic, anytime someone screws me over, I don't need to play that stupid emotional pinball game of like, oh, I, I've known them for so long, they, they did X, Y, and Z for me, is this how I treat a friend? Blah, 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 okay. All of that is noise that keeps you from seeing that your life belongs to you. And all you can ever hope to control is what you do in the present with the intention of enriching yourself and the people you love in the future. Now, when it comes to placing Ben on this chart, the naive, why can't we be friends, singing pussy that I am at heart, has generally refrained from passing any definitive judgment on Ben's character when he'd say some dumb shit like this. Because believe it or not, I actually fuck with Ben as a personality. You know how you've got that one retarded friend who you don't really see that often, but whenever you do, he's like totally chill and it's not, like the, like the vibes are nice, so you don't call him out on his bullshit? That's the space that Ben Shapiro has occupied in my mind over the past couple of years, where like, I just see him as a, just a friendly Jew who isn't really hurting anybody when he wants to share his takes on wet ass pussy or the Barbie movie or any of that shit, you know? Whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. Hold up. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pull out game weak. P word. P word is female genitalia. But I've since come to realize that this veneer of decency and inoffensiveness has become a sort of rhetorical force field that prevents Ben and his colleagues from ever being held to account for the deeply indecent and offensive things that they say about our political landscape. It's the strangest fucking phenomenon where because the person in front of you is talking like a psychologically normal human being, you know, in the sense that they're, they're not shitting themselves profusely or on the verge of tears or screaming hysterically, they get a free pass to say some of the most delusional shit imaginable. <laughs> and nobody calls them out on it. Because the second you start speaking with the rage and intensity that's adequate to the situation, these faggots start bitching about civility and turning down the temperature as if they had no role to play in the breakdown of civility and the turning up of the temperature with the toxic lies that they so calmly injected into our discourse over the past eight years. As an example of this, let's revisit Ben's summary of January 6th. I I'm sorry, like, even people who are, who are suggesting that January 6th was a massive crisis level event for the problem, not just an ugly, horrible thing that happened, which I agree, ugly, horrible, bad images of people storming the Capitol building, hurting police officers and all the rest, that was not an existential crisis for the United States, not remotely. It was a bunch of dolts and some people who were like in good faith there and wandering the halls who held up the procedure for like two hours. And then that was it. This exposition is a masterpiece of misinformation that leaves the average retard in Ben's audience with a grossly distorted view of reality. It makes no mention of Trump's role in inciting the riot, his intentions to subvert the election with fraudulent slates of electors, him refusing to tell the mob to go home for three hours, or any of the other relevant details that point to Trump being an authoritarian. The way Ben tells it, one would think that the only thing that was wrong about January 6th was the violence, 
which was perpetrated by a couple dolts, dweebs, and knuckleheads, who were trailed by a few well-meaning tourists who just got a little too excited about visiting the capital. One would also think that Trump had virtually nothing to do with it. This was just a haphazardly organized group of people who convened at the Capitol for no specific reason, to serve no specific political purpose, to fulfill the wishes of no specific malicious actor. And ultimately, all their belligerence amounted to was a two-hour delay before the proceedings continued to run like clockwork. This is absolute and unadulterated bullshit. The Senate was called into recess at 2.13 and the House by 2.20. The police secured the Capitol a little before 6 and Congress reconvened at 8. So what actually happened is Trump's mob delayed the proceedings by roughly six hours. But here I'd like to stress how contemptible it is to minimize the significance of the sitting president of the United States ordering a mob of his henchmen to obstruct the peaceful transfer of power by pointing to how long the obstruction lasted. According to Ben, the correct way to gauge the moral significance of Jan 6th is to look at a stopwatch. Sure, a two hour delay is bad, but at least it wasn't three and it would have been better if it was just one. Bro, this is about as stupid as me looking back on Trump's assassination attempt and being like, guys, what's what's all the fuss about? I mean, he just, like, sure, he got shot in his ear, but it only interrupted his speech for like two and a half minutes, and at the end of the day, he still made it to bed on time. You know, he, he was able to get that eight hours of shut-eye. Obviously, sane people would recognize that such an appraisal of the event would be an appalling instance of me missing the forest for the trees. A presidential candidate was shot in broad daylight, and commenting on Trump's timetable instead of condemning the shooting and worrying for the future of the country is nothing but naked lunacy. But the most egregious misrepresentation from this confection of politically expedient lies is the claim that this wasn't even remotely an existential crisis for the United States. That was not an existential crisis for the United States, not remotely. To drill down on the stupidity of this claim, and what it says about Ben, that he would have the audacity to make it so boldly, we first need to acknowledge a couple facts about Mike Pence's heroism on Jan 6th. On multiple occasions leading up to and on the date in question, Trump urged Pence to overturn the election in Trump's favor by unilaterally rejecting or returning states electoral votes for Biden during the certification of the election results. Trump asked Pence to do it on Christmas, New Year's, and January 3rd. Trump told him to do it in a meeting on the 4th. Trump was sending out tweets on the 5th telling his supporters to show up to the Capitol on the 6th and setting the expectation in their heads that Pence was going to reject the votes. When Trump met with Pence alone and Pence refused to comply, Trump said he'd have to publicly criticize him. He then put out a statement lying about how him and Pence were in total agreement about Pence's authority to overturn the election. On the day of the certification, Trump called him and said, you can either go down in history as a patriot, or you can go down in history as a pussy. And he continued to put pressure on him during his speech. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify, and we become president, and you are the happiest people. Suffice it to say that millions of people were hoping that Pence would do this. And then Pence, who unlike Ben and virtually everyone else in the Republican Party, has a robust backbone that he used to uphold the principles of our democracy, walked into the House chamber at 1 p.m., and tweeted the following letter at 102, from which I will read you two especially striking excerpts. In the first, he says, It is my considered judgment that my oath to support and defend the Constitution constrains me from claiming unilateral authority to determine which electoral votes should be counted and which should not. And in the second, he says, Four years ago, surrounded by my family, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution, which ended with the words, So help me God. Today I want to assure the American people that I will keep the oath I made to them and I will keep the oath I made to Almighty God. When the joint session of Congress convenes today, I will do my duty to see to it that we open the certificates to the electors of the several states, we hear objections raised by senators and representatives, and we count the votes of the Electoral College for President and Vice President in a manner consistent with our Constitution, laws, and history. So help me God. And God so helped him. Despite Trump's repeated demands for Pence to, quote, do the right thing by rejecting Biden's electoral votes, which were followed by rioters calling for Mike Pence's hanging as they fucked shit up at the Capitol. Once the police declared that the building was safe, and after Congress concluded the count, 
At 3.41 a.m. the next day, Mike Pence honored his oath to support and defend the Constitution. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for President of the United States are as follows. Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for Vice President of the United States is 538. Within that whole number, a majority is 270. The votes for Vice President of the United States are as follows. Kamala D. Harris of the state of California has received 306 votes. Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana has received 232 votes. The announcement of the state of the vote by the President of the Senate shall be deemed a sufficient declaration of the persons elected President and Vice President of the United States, each for the term beginning on the 20th day of January 2021, and shall be entered together with the list of the votes on the journals of the Senate and the House of Representatives. The purpose of the joint session having concluded, pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1, 117th Congress, the chair declares the joint session dissolved. The most important pillar of American sovereignty on January 6, 2021, was Mike Pence's spine. If Pence had caved, the country would have plunged into an unprecedented constitutional crisis, there would have been riots in the streets, and the resulting breakdown in law and order would have brought us that much closer to a civil war. For Ben to say that this event was not remotely an existential crisis for the United States is as offensive to basic human sanity as me saying that the bullet that grazed Trump's ear was not remotely an existential crisis for his head. So in light of this little explication, what are we to think of Ben's intelligence and intentions? Is he really an asshole? Or is he just an idiot trapped in an asshole's body, condemned by fate to speak as dishonestly as an asshole does? It is my considered judgment that Ben Shapiro is a consciously dishonest asshole who overlooks, minimizes, and misrepresents Trump's authoritarian tendencies for the sole purpose of furthering a conservative political agenda, to the great detriment of the integrity of our country. No reasonable person can accept his account of January 6th as veridical because it is based entirely on a series of lies, half-truths, and omissions that are much more consistent with an asshole's desire to distort reality than an idiot's capacity to make an honest mistake. When idiots make honest mistakes, they can be best explained by incompetence, forgetfulness, and a lack of attention to detail, because the cumulative effect of their errors is too ambiguous for one to allege that the idiot intended to act in the way that he did for so meager and unclear a benefit. But when assholes lie, the opposite is true. The seed of unreality that they're trying to plant is nurtured through a combination of competence, care, and attention to detail so sustained and so great for a benefit so obvious and so one-sided that there is no other possible explanation for why their statements take the tortured form that they do than a calculated intention to deceive and mislead. And this is exactly the form that both Ben's defense of Trump as a non-authoritarian and his account of January 6th take. In the former, he fails to clarify what exactly the definition of an authoritarian is, while also failing to provide any clear and specific instances of Trump not being an authoritarian. And in the latter, he conveniently fails to mention key details of Jan 6th, which, if stated plainly, would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Trump is an authoritarian. Follow Ben's lead in the making of no mistake. Ben is not an idiot who doesn't know how to justify which words should be used when. Ben is a highly intelligent, articulate, and unprincipled liar who's sanitizing the reputation of a traitor because he cares more about empowering the Republican Party than he does about protecting the United States. So shame on Ben Shapiro for being a malignant asshole who actively spreads lies that threaten the survival of our union. And shame on anyone who would cite him as an honest broker of information. Hi, are you enjoying yourself? Do you find this content valuable? Do you feel that I am a sexy, young, and refreshing new voice that needs to be heard by many more people in the sphere of alternative media? If you're checking all those boxes, then it stands to reason that you probably want to support the show. So here are a couple ways you can do that. First, you can like, share, comment, and subscribe. Second, you can make a direct payment to my Buy Me A Coffee page, 
of whatever amount is in harmony with your budget. And third, if you're interested in a more intimate and longer term content relationship, you can subscribe to my private publishing feed, where you will gain access to my extensive back catalog of exclusive content and to the many other creative works that I will be publishing on that channel in the foreseeable future. With that, I conclude the message from our sponsor, which is me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. About two weeks ago, I finished a playthrough of The Last of Us, which is a gorgeously crafted video game that tells the story of Joel Miller and Ellie Williams as they struggle to survive in a world where over 60% of the global population has fallen victim to a parasitic fungal infection known as the Cordyceps Brain Infection, or CBI for short. The inspiration for this fictional condition is the very real Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, or zombie ant fungus, as it was described by David Attenborough in the following clip. These bullet ants are showing some worrying symptoms. Spores from a parasitic fungus called cordyceps have infiltrated their bodies and their minds. Its infected brain directs this ant upwards. Then, utterly disorientated, it grips a stem with its mandibles. Those afflicted, that are discovered by the workers, are quickly taken away and dumped far away from the colony. It seems extreme, but this is the reason why. Like something out of science fiction, the fruiting body of the cordyceps erupts from the ant's head. It can take three weeks to grow, and when finished, the deadly spores will burst from its tip. Then, any ant in the vicinity will be in serious risk of death. In the game, the fungus' infection of its host progresses through four stages. In the first stage, which occurs within roughly two days of infection, the host loses their higher brain function, and with it, their humanity rendering them hyper-aggressive and incapable of reason or rational thought. The aspect of this game that I found to be the most haunting is how viscerally it forces you to grapple with a moral reality where more than half of humanity is hyper-aggressive and incapable of reason or rational thought, and how thoroughly that circumstance erodes any possibility for trust and empathy and collaboration. Literally every expression of charity or vulnerability or selflessness suddenly becomes an opportunity for you to get robbed, infected, or killed. You don't have the luxury of caring for other people because your concern for them will be the proximate cause of your untimely demise. Here's Joel's friend Bill articulating that depressing calculus as he tells Joel to abandon Ellie. Seriously, you gotta take that kid back to where you found her. I can't just take her back. Then send her packing, let her find her own way. But let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. It was a partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. So you know what I did? I wasn't the fuck up. And I realized it's gotta be just me. Bill, it ain't, it ain't like that. It's bullshit. It is just like that. When Bill suggests that Joel leave a 14-year-old child, to fend for herself in a wilderness teeming with bloodthirsty monsters, that is not an expression of Bill's callous indifference for the sanctity of human life. It's a perfectly rational statement of the cost of emotional investment in an environment where the slightest mistake could have you end up like this, or this, or this. Now before I make the point that you know I'm about to make, I want to step back for a moment and fully flesh out the argument by articulating exactly what's so problematic about having CBI. Take a look at these infected and listen very closely. Killing these people isn't acceptable because they look ugly as fuck, or because they deserve to be shot for getting themselves bit, or because they infected or killed somebody close to you. Ugly people still deserve moral consideration, nobody deserves to die for having the bad fortune of falling sick, 
and killing your loved one's attacker does nothing to compensate you for your loss. In a perfect world, given infinite time and resources, the most compassionate way to deal with these freaks would be to physically restrain them until we can give them some drug that snaps them out of their psychopathic stupor. Killing them wouldn't even be an option on the table. But in the real world, where there are more of them than there are of us, they're actively trying to kill us, and every second we spend trying to rehabilitate them is a second we could have spent gathering food or finding shelter or rebuilding society, killing them becomes acceptable because it's the most cost-effective way of securing the survival of our species. You can't talk to these people. They don't occupy the same reality that we do. Their condition prevents them from engaging in rational discourse or having a fact-based discussion about anything. There's simply no way to bring their goals into faithful alignment with ours because we can't communicate. And this inaccessibility to conversation, at bottom, is what makes it acceptable to kill the infected. The second reason to kill the infected, which is arguably just as, if not more important than the first, is that the decision to not kill an infected is essentially the same as allowing it to kill or infect somebody else down the line, which is essentially the same as betraying humanity by siding with the infected. If another human gets infected or killed because you decided to not kill the infected that attacked them, the moral responsibility for that casualty falls on you. In the best case scenario, your dereliction of duty will have resulted in the needless loss of a human life. And in the worst case, on top of killing one of our allies, you will have given birth to one of our enemies, who in the fullness of time will come back to kill even more of our allies. Despite what gay fence sitters on the internet may tell you, even doing nothing is a choice, and that choice is by no means neutral. So, now that all of these game theoretic pieces have been put into play, the next step is to kill all Republicans, because they're the infected, right? Eh, uh. wrong. First and foremost, the economic constraints that make killing the infected in The Last of Us morally necessary don't apply in the United States. We aren't living in a post-apocalyptic shithole where we're constantly plagued with hunger, disease, and poverty. We're living in the most prosperous country on Earth, in a context where we can trust that our neighbors share our antipathy for the prospect of waging a civil war. But if we really care about preventing the outbreak of such a conflict, we need to speak soberly about how to contain its flashpoints, and in cases where efforts at containment fail, apportion blame to the responsible parties without drawing moral equivalences where none exist. Every time we stick our heads in the sand and repeat contrived platitudes about both sides being equally bad, we are allowing the infected to roam freely among us, at the expense of our future safety and security. Second, the problem with the infected is not that they hold socially conservative views or prefer a more isolationist foreign policy. If the only reasons this nigga wanted to come up to me was to tell me that marriage is between a man and a woman, that life starts at conception, or that we shouldn't be sending our troops to die in pointless proxy wars, I would have no problem with that. In a pluralistic democracy like the United States, we are bound to disagree with our fellow countrymen on a whole host of issues, and the mere fact of our disagreeing is not a valid casus belli. The problem with the infected is also not that they want to exercise their constitutionally protected right to free speech. The big motherfucking problem with the infected is that their speech is utterly divorced from reality, and that they're engaged in an unrelenting assault on the norms and institutions that protect our way of life. In the case of Trump supporters and fellow travelers, this would include their active disdain for the rule of law, checks and balances, the peaceful transfer of power, small r Republican government, and the Constitution itself. It is often said of anyone with the temerity to point out these offenses that they're suffering from Trump derangement syndrome, as if such a diagnosis is sufficient to totally exonerate Trump from whatever brand of impropriety he's being accused of. But this is neither how medicine nor justice works. You don't get to nullify a charge of wrongdoing by coming up with a fake medical condition to use as a get-out-of-jail free card anytime you're up to some fuck shit. In fact, the inclination to use this term, without a hint of shame, embarrassment, or irony, is actually a symptom of a much more pernicious and pervasive pathology called maggot brain infection. And unlike the charlatans who warn of the nebulous dangers of TDS, I'm actually prepared to give you a comprehensive set of diagnostic criteria for this deadly condition. Maggot brain infection is a close cousin of the cordyceps brain infection. It is also a parasitic fungal infection that totally degrades one's capacity for rational thought, but it differs in a few important respects. The first difference is the mode of transmission. Whereas CBI patients contract the condition by inhaling toxic fungal spores or being bit by another infected host, those suffering from MBI simply suck an unfathomable amount of cum out of Donald Trump's mushroom-shaped cock. 
which contains a mind-altering pathogen that causes them to lose contact with reality. One piece of etymological trivia that I would be remiss not to mention is that the maggot in maggot brain infection is actually a portmanteau of the terms MAGA, which is an abbreviation of Trump's presidential campaign slogan, and faggot, the derogatory term for homosexuals. The term also has the added benefit of being evocative of spineless worms that eat away at the core of an apple, in much the same way that those with MBI, who I will henceforth refer to as maggots, eat away at the core of our democracy. The second difference between the two conditions is that MBI doesn't manifest itself as visibly as CBI does, and so this makes it incredibly difficult for those in the general population to notice when they're in the presence of a maggot. Hell, you might just be a maggot yourself and not even realize it. The severity of any maggot's infection can be best understood by finding their position on the following diagram of concentric circles of support for Trump. In the outermost circle, we have apolitical people who find him funny and entertaining, but have no clue about how extreme he is. One layer down, we have people who think wokeness is the greatest threat to civilization, and that Trump is a cure for it. They have a cursory awareness of his extremism, but they perceive it as benign by comparison to the leftist insanity that they see on college campuses, in corporate boardrooms, and basically every corner of elite society, where it seems like you have to be a pansexual communist to get any goddamn respect. This group dislikes Trump, but not as much as it hates wokeness. As an aside, I used to be this kind of maggot when I voted for Trump in 2020. But fortunately, I've since made a full recovery. The subsequent layers of support make up the new confederacy, which can be further divided into three layers, the cucked, the soft, and the hard. The cucked confederates are Republicans who make absolutely no effort to defend Trump's character because they recognize that he's a piece of shit, but who will vote for him regardless because they're just that desperate for a political victory. At this stage of infection, MBI dissolves the spines of its hosts, leaving them to rationalize their lack of moral principles by repeating platitudes like all politicians lie and I support the Republican Party. They cast their subservience to Trump as an exercise in political pragmatism rather than a debasing capitulation to a guy who's tightly gripping their balls and threatening to rip him off if they don't do his bidding. Then we get to enthusiastic fans of Trump, or soft confederates, whose views vary depending on their IQ and perception of the hostility of the audience they're speaking to. But as a general matter, these niggas don't believe in vaccines, they think the 2020 election was stolen, that January 6th was a non-event that's getting blown out of proportion for political reasons, and that there's some parity between the left and right's contributions to the problem of political violence. It should be noted that this cohort's concerns about political violence are entirely perfunctory and incoherent. Despite constantly spreading lies, which, if accepted as true, would make political violence not only justified but necessary, these maggots somehow maintain that civility and high voter participation is the best way for the country to break free from the noose that the deep state has tied around its neck. Think about that for a second. The softies believe that we live in a banana republic with an illegitimate president who rose to power by rigging the election against the American people, and that instead of making an example out of that tyrant by killing him and his co-conspirators, the solution to their problems is to just vote even harder in the next election, which is bound to be rigged by the same niggas who rigged the last one. Trump's cock is a hell of a drug. Last, but most certainly not least, we have Trump's most devoted supporters, the hard confederates, who, unlike their softer counterparts, actually have the courage of their delusional convictions. It's up to us people now, the American people. I want to tell you ready to do this. One more time. I want to tell you ready to do this. And whatever it takes, I'll lay my life down if it takes. Absolutely. That's why we showed up today. These maggots believe that Trump is a shit, that his word is gospel, and that violence is an indispensable tool for achieving their aims. We are on the other side. Don't make us go against you. Understand the side. Pick a side. These are our streets. They're the ones who showed up to the Capitol on January 6th and called for Mike Pence to be hanged. No. Is that true? I didn't I'm, hear, I'm hearing no. reports that Pence caved. No I'm way. telling you, if Pence caved, we're going to drag motherfuckers through the streets. You fucking politicians are going to get fucking drugged through the streets. Yeah. Because we're not going to have our fucking shit stolen. We're not going to have our election, our country stolen. If we find out you politicians voted for it, we're going to drag your fucking ass through the street. 
Because this is the second fucking revolution. And we're fucking done. I'm telling you right now, Ryan Nichols said it. If you voted for fucking treason, we're gonna drag your fucking ass through the street. They're the ones who make Mitt Romney spend $5,000 a day on security for his family. And they're the ones who are influencing our politics by threatening the lives and families of any Republican senator, representative, or election official who's inclined to resist Trump's assault on our democracy. When left to their own devices, these maggots are ready to kill and be killed in the name of Trump. And the success of our efforts to circumvent the Second Civil War will depend on our ability to adequately identify and respond to the extremist threat that they and their comparatively tame accomplices represent. A pressing challenge in preparing such a response, however, is the basic inability of normal and well-mannered people to treat maggots like the maliciously dishonest and unintelligent pieces of shit that they are. This apprehension stems from an erroneous assumption that maggots are just like the rest of us, and that upon being presented with enough evidence, treated with enough patience, and controlled with enough care, they will realize the error of their ways. But what this thinking ignores is that the same policy of zen-like tolerance for the intolerable is precisely what has enabled maggots to slip into a parallel reality that bears no relation to ours in the first place, and what compels us to now grapple with the ethical dilemmas of sharing a country with these fucking animals. To fully understand the failure of this kind of hackneyed diplomacy, we must spend some time considering the implications of the defining symptom of MBI, which is reality denialism. Reality denialism is a radically hostile orientation towards the truth that is characterized by the rejection of verifiable facts in a systematic, sustained, and intransigent fashion. More simply put, it's when niggas lie out their asses so shamelessly, routinely, and nonsensically that they essentially kick themselves loose from our shared reality. While the effects of this divorce can range from inconsequential to devastating, the inclination to accommodate it is morally unacceptable in all contexts, because it normalizes the view that all methods of getting to the truth are equally valid and respectable, and that there's no real tension between the divergent realities that they yield. Needless to say, that view is utter horseshit. And to explain why, I'll draw your attention to Alex Jones and the lies he spread about the parents of the kids who were slaughtered at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14, 2012. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, literally hours after it happened and the kids' bodies were still warm, Jones alleged that the entire thing was a false flag operation which would be used as a pretext for stripping Americans of their right to bear arms. This is staged. And you know, I've been saying the last few months, get ready for big mass shootings. Look, for, people got to find the clips the last two months. I said, they are launching attacks. They're getting ready. I can see them warming up with Obama. They've got a bigger majority in the Congress now in the Senate. They are going to come after our guns. Look for mass shootings. And then magically it happens. They are coming. They are coming. They are coming. This description is in stark and irreconcilable conflict with the truth, which is that 26 real people were actually shot and killed by a truly deranged individual. But upon hearing these two claims for the first time, why would it make perfect sense for me, before I do so much as a single Google search, to dismiss Jones' version of events? This is a bit like asking why we should reject the testimony of a four-year-old when he's arguing with a dairy farmer about how he saw a cow jump over the moon. Not all sources of information are equally credible, and therefore worthy of being taken seriously. The world can't grind to a halt every time a dipshit in a dress shirt with a mic and a camera has a hot take. Of course, this is not to say that said dipshits can never be right about anything, but it is to say that our perception of their trustworthiness can't be based on the fact that they made a single basket after a thousand airballs. Even broken clocks are right twice a day. The real way to judge the functionality of a clock is to observe the mechanisms that govern its movement to ensure that they're faithfully tracking the passage of 60 seconds, not that they're showing the right time. A broken clock displaying the correct time is only right for two minutes in a 24-hour day. A functioning clock that's off by a minute is still mostly right most of the time and can be recalibrated so that it's totally right all of the time. What we're concerned with here is processes, not outcomes. In that vein, when it comes to optimizing for the outcome of telling the truth, Alex Jones's processes are fucking atrocious. He lies constantly, routinely takes the most conspiratorial interpretation of any set of facts, refuses to forthrightly grapple with objections to his claims, and only issues mealy-mouthed retractions and clarifications either after he's gotten the shit suit out of him or the damage from his lies has been done. He's an informational crack dealer, 
who makes his living by selling lies and diet supplements to an audience of detestable retards, and the alacrity with which these retards consume his lies, and the conviction with which they defend them as true, says something deeply troubling about who they are as people. For instance, here's Nicole Hockley, whose son Dylan was murdered in his first grade classroom, sharing her experience of trying to convince Jones's fans that she wasn't a crisis actor. There's no point arguing with them. That, that I've learned the hard way. No matter what you do, they're never going to believe. They say, show us the death certificates. Oh, that's a forgery. Show us the pictures. Oh, that's a forgery. Show us proof that your kid ever existed. Oh, you just made that up. And it, you, you, can't, you can't win. And here's Jacqueline Barden sharing the details of the letter she received questioning her son Daniel's death. Did you and uh, Mark get threatening letters? Yeah, one, one, I remember one saying that they were at Daniel's grave and they had peed on his grave because they didn't think anybody, you know, they didn't believe that Daniel was buried. And another letter- letters came to your home? What's that? These letters came to your yeah. home. And then another letter was that they were gonna, they were gonna dig Daniel's grave up because he wasn't there to prove it. In keeping with the grave digging theme, Here's a stupid cunt arguing for the propriety of the request. I watched a lot of true crime, and they exhume bodies all the time. It's not unusual. That's all you can do. If you really want to prove that this didn't happen, what else can you do but to have the bodies exhumed? To answer a question, you can look at obituaries, 911 calls, death certificates, the Connecticut State Police's After Action Report, the state's attorney for the Judicial District of Danbury's report, crime scene evidence, extensive news coverage, and multiple contemporaneous eyewitness accounts that all attest to the fact that the shooting really did happen and that those kids really did die, you dumb fucking bitch. If you look through all that material and insist that it still didn't happen, and that all those discursive lines of evidence were fabricated by a conspiracy that implicates 26,000 people over the course of 11 years, then you are a reality denier, and there's nothing that can be done for you. What I hope to impress upon anyone who feels the slightest sympathy for these disgusting whores is that your sympathy enables their sickness. These are not rational actors who have the ability to dispassionately consider evidence and arrive at a position that puts them in harmony with the truth. They're worthless sluts whose whole style of inquiry precludes a discovery of any such resolution. They shift the goalposts, reject evidence that contradicts the predetermined conclusion they've been spoon-fed, and speak with unshakable confidence about matters that they have no right to have a strong opinion about, to the point that they'll desecrate graves, threaten the lives of grieving parents, and exhort them to exhume the corpses of their dead children. The only appropriate response for this kind of repulsive self-confidence is contempt. Anytime these animals walk into a room, they should understand that they're lesser. We should refer to them in dehumanizing terms. They should be made to pay a much more burdensome social cost for wallowing in the depths of their ignorance as shamelessly as they do. And they should never, for even a moment, be allowed to think that they have a right to complain about it. You don't get to think, talk, and act like a retard, and then insist that you be treated like a lucid and normal adult. That's not how society works. Society works when real ass niggas stand the fuck up and let bitch ass niggas know what time it is. That's what the founders did with the crown, that's what the union did with the confederacy, and that's what the left has failed to do with right-wing reality deniers on multiple occasions for the past eight years. Bro, when seven out of ten Republicans were downing Obama's citizenship in 2016, that should have been the end of the Republican Party. Obama should have called a press conference the day that poll came out, saying that 70% of roughly half the country is retarded and that he's enlisting the help of the CDC to quarantine the infected and develop a vaccine to contain the spread. But is that what he did? No, because you gotta be civil and stick to the my fellow Americans bullshit. And now look at how far we've come. After that, we had 72% of Republicans saying that Biden's 2020 win wasn't legitimate in July 2021. 80% think Biden was the one calling the shots in Trump's hush money case in Manhattan. 34% think the FBI was behind January 6th. 72% think it wasn't a big deal and it's time to move on, while 24% think it should never be forgotten. And I just, like, I don't even know how the fuck I'm supposed to parse those data. Okay, like, does that mean the FBI did January 6th, but we don't need to focus on it and we can just let bygones be bygones because, you know, everybody makes mistakes, right? Like, we've all been in the unfortunate position of a federal agency that <laughs> secretly conspires and then successfully launches a coup attempt 
to defame the reputation of roughly half the electorate. We, we've all been there. Pope, but he's nerve victim, am I right? Is there a Republican in the country that believes that shit? Probably. Okay, I, I have no idea. The bottom line is that we won't have a country if we continue to tolerate the schizophrenic bullshit. And everyday Americans should be much more vocal in expressing their distaste for it, because this policy of appeasement has gone on for long enough. One of the many disconcerting moral truths that The Last of Us forces players to contend with is that all lives are not equally sacred, valuable, or worthy of protection. The game is crystal clear about the fact that there's a hierarchy of people who are more and less worthy of our moral consideration, with the basis for that judgment being their potential value to humanity. At the very top we have Ellie, who is immune to CBI. This makes her the most important being on the planet because her body can be used to engineer a vaccine. Having a vaccine would make it so that getting bit by an infected wouldn't render you an immutably hostile entity to the people around you. Rather than becoming a force that's guaranteed to harm your neighbors, you can help them by contributing to the maintenance and development of civilization, or at the very least, not actively damaging that project. This fundamental shift in the implications of getting bit is humanity's only shot at rebuilding what it lost, so Ellie, being the only path to realizing that hopeful future, becomes the queen of our moral hierarchy. Every life on Earth is objectively worth less than hers. On the next rung of the hierarchy, we have the doctors who have the knowledge required to synthesize a vaccine. Then there's the Fireflies, the revolutionary militia group that protects those doctors and has the ultimate aim of restoring all branches of the US government. Then we have regular people who are sympathetic to the Fireflies' aims, and that's basically it for the lives that we should care about. The remaining factions are civilians who have nothing to contribute to a positive vision for humanity, hunters who loot and kill anyone who enters their territory, Fedra, the military dictatorship that oppresses the people it looks after and stands in opposition to the Fireflies, and finally, the infected. Now in polite society, autistically placing real people into the kinds of Manichaean categories that I've just described is generally viewed as an expression of one's callousness and unthinking chauvinism. It's somehow imagined that all human lives are equally dignified and predisposed to spreading feelings of love and beauty and creativity, and that demurring from this precept makes you an asshole. But I would argue that this kind of profligate retardation is a privilege of prosperity, and that one must be especially insulated from poverty, disease, and violence to endorse such effete delusions. On top of that, I'd say that the aversion towards making the kinds of moral judgment calls that the last of us shoves in your face actively makes the world a worse place that threatens everyone's safety by blurring the lines between the truth and fiction, intelligence and stupidity, and good and evil. Take Piers reprimanding Destiny for his comments about the firefighter who died at the Trump rally as an example. Let me explain my position, because I'm not a conservative. I'm not, I'm not on either side in your race, right? Here's what I think about what you did. You'd like to fire off, as you've done so far in this debate, about your fury at how disgusting Republicans are, how inhumane they are, how they never have any empathy, blah, 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 blah. And then you yourself actually are exactly the, the person that you're describing. You are inhuman. You are somebody who seems almost gleeful that a young firefighter with a family, with a wife and children, who he was protecting as he was shot dead, that he deserved what was coming to him because he went to a President Trump rally, a man who was President of the United States until recently for four years and maybe again. You sound almost gleeful, Destin, and I'm sorry, that makes you, frankly, despicable. If you're ignorant about American politics, Pierce's admonition of destiny probably seems like an all-too-sensible expression of disgust at an internet jackass who has the gall to besmirch the good name of a valiant firefighter who died protecting his family. According to this article on Cory Comparator, he was a stand-up guy, a true brother of the fire service, and a man of conviction. But in discussions of politics, where we're advocating for leaders and policies and ideas, whose influence will affect many more people than your average stand-up guy and man of conviction, we need to be a little more critical in how we evaluate Corey's position on our moral hierarchy. What exactly did the guy stand up for? Where did his convictions lie? Well, by his mere presence at a Trump rally, we know that he stood for an aspiring autocrat who tried to subvert the peaceful transfer of power, who's openly talked about terminating the Constitution, suggested that a U.S. general be executed for treason, and invited Russia to attack our NATO allies. So at minimum, we know that he supported a man who sought to overthrow the US government, who would take pleasure in the death of a United States general, 
and who would call for our enemies to attack our allies at the drop of a hat. All of which is just a long-winded way of saying that he supported an enemy of the United States. Now, I don't know about you guys, but where I come from, you know, around my parts, around my private parts, around my motherfucking neck of the woods, if you support one of my enemies, that makes you one of my enemies, right? Ergo, if you support an enemy of the United States, that makes you an enemy of the United States, right? Tra transitive property type shit. If we take a look at Corey's Twitter feed, we can see that he prefers the company of a Russian dictator who bombs children's hospitals and shopping malls over the company of his compatriots. He's also content to respond to concerns about the welfare of Palestinian families whose homes have been destroyed by saying they'll get over it, just as the Japanese did. And you know what's wild about this last tweet? He was responding to none other than our very own champion of human decency, Piers Morgan. What a small world we live in. Anyway, notice the asymmetry here. This dead jackass gets to freely express his support for potential and actual dictators and make light of Palestinian suffering. But the second Destiny makes fun of him for getting shot, the pussies on this panel want to start pearl clutching and pissing themselves trying to defend the guy's legacy. According to them, norms of civility and decency are only to be enforced against people who criticize indecency and incivility. Maggots get a free pass to be as maliciously edgy and insensitive as they want to be, but as soon as you start giving them that same energy, they just turn into fucking Caitlyn Jenner. All right? They do some gender reassignment surgery on themselves, just chop the dick and balls all the way the fuck off, and then start identifying as a bunch of dainty little hoes who would never hurt a soul. You know, just the most inoffensive little bitches that you ever laid your eyes on. You know what I think a fitting analogy for this dumbass story would be? Imagine a bunch of clan members are holding a rally, where they're all wearing their white hoods and burning crosses and chanting you will not replace us, and then upon hearing gunfire, one of them gets shot and killed while protecting his family. I would hope that decent people would react to such an incident by saying, Damn, that sucks. I don't fuck with the Klan at all, but this is America, and people should be free to express their political opinions, however odious they are to the rest of us, without fear of violent reprisal. Right, so that's the first reaction I would want. And then on second thought, I would want people to say, But if I step away from the civil liberties aspect of the whole thing, and just think about, you know, like, like the moral statures of the people involved, I think it's pretty clear that they're all pieces of shit. You know, I mean, they're literally clan members. And I mean, like, sure, maybe one of them makes like a mean apple pie or helps out at his local homeless shelter on the weekend, but my appreciation of those aspects of his character is overshadowed by my disgust for his conscious and deliberate enthusiasm for white supremacy. But the attitude that pseudo-journalists like Pierce seem to have taken is to focus solely on the clan member's final act of valor to the exclusion of any consideration of the wider context in which he was operating. There's no mention of the fact that the guy was a Klan member, that he had fairly sinister ideological commitments about non-white people, and that the whole reason he was there was to express those commitments and further his political agenda. The way a fellow like Pierce tells it, you wouldn't even know he was a Klan member. To an outside observer, it would seem like a poor guy who just wanted to have some fun got shot at an especially festive Halloween party. That's what explains all the ghosts and the raging bonfires and the funny dance moves. In any case, I'm not saying that law-abiding maggots should get shot for exercising their First Amendment rights. I'm saying that in cases where they do get shot, our assessment of their moral worth should be grounded in reality, as opposed to a desire to pander to the sensibilities of their delusional allies. We should speak honestly about the kind of world they were trying to build, and why, to the extent that their death is a diminution of the chances of that world becoming a reality, all other things being held equal, it's probably a good thing that they died. 99 tumors are better than 100, regardless of how you get rid of the 100th tumor. Likewise, 99 maggots are better than 100, regardless of how you get rid of the last maggot. Of course, we should all hope that they're neutralized through conversation rather than violence, but let's be clear about our reasons for having that preference. Killing maggots isn't wrong because their lives are just as valuable as anyone else's. Killing maggots is wrong because of the risk that normalizing political violence poses to people whose lives actually do matter. And in an American context, I think we should make this demarcation between lives that matter and lives that don't by looking to the preamble of our Constitution and assessing the contributions of the life we're judging to the goals listed therein. So let's try doing that with Trump, the man who Corey died supporting. Does Trump help us form a more perfect union? No. 
Trump has done more to damage the state of our union and the norms and institutions that have traditionally safeguarded its perfection than anyone else in modern American history. Does Trump help us establish justice? Once again, no. A concern for justice entails a respect for fairness and the truth, neither of which can be found in the recesses of Trump's brain. He's undermined the rule of law by threatening to prosecute his political opponents, alleging that all efforts to investigate his criminal conduct are themselves a witch hunt and eroding his base's trust in the courts whenever they rule against him. Baselessly casting aspersions on the independence and trustworthiness of our criminal justice system as the sitting and former president of the United States is the opposite of establishing justice. It's putting justice in jeopardy. What about ensuring domestic tranquility? Nope. Trump has routinely attacked his political opponents in ways that do anything but ensure domestic tranquility and that have fundamentally changed our politics for the worse. In support of this point, I'll direct your attention to John McCain's response to a woman claiming that Obama was an Arab at one of McCain's rallies. I gotta ask you a question. I do not uh, believe in, I can't trust Obama. I, I, I have read about him and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No ma'am, no ma'am. No? No ma'am, no ma'am, no ma'am. He's a, he's a, he's a decent, family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues, and that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. Thank you. What a sight for sore eyes it is to see a Republican who won't reflexively question his political rival's competence, citizenship, and loyalty to this country. Meanwhile, this Nick Trump wants to argue with Rachel Scott about whether Kamala is a black or Indian DEI hire. Sir, do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is only on the ticket because she is a black woman? Well, I can say no. I think it's maybe a little bit different. So uh, I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much. And she was always of Indian heritage. And she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. And now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a historically black college. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't. Because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went, she became a black person. Just to be clear, sir, do and you I believe think, that she is I think she somebody a... should look into that too when you ask a continue in a very hostile, nasty tone. What about providing for the common defense? Threatening to abandon our NATO allies, actually abandoning our Kurdish ones, and blocking aid to Ukraine as it attempts to defend itself against the predations of a dictator are not provisions for the common defense. They're concessions to our enemies, who will make good use of them should the day ever come that we need the help of the allies we've betrayed. Does Trump help promote the general welfare? Negative. Trump has a history of threatening to withhold aid from his fellow Americans for reasons that are purely political. He only wishes welfare on those who agree with him, which is to say that he promotes a very specific rather than general welfare. Does he help secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity? Nope. Trump doesn't understand, much less believe in, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, or the right to protest. Seeing as how Trump's 0 for 6 when it comes to honoring the goals of the preamble, and 0 for 7 if we count ordaining and establishing the Constitution as a goal, because, you know, he wanted to terminate it, true American patriots can confidently say that his life has no value. They can also say that anyone who supports him, by lacking the good sense to notice, as well as the courage to criticize, his flagrant insults to our nation's most important founding document, is also worthless from the point of view of America. Based on the explanations I've provided, I think it's incontrovertibly true to say that for well-wishers of the United States of America, the death of Cory Comparator is no biggie. So fuck him. May his memory serve as a cautionary tale for any maggot who dares to dream that his death will be an occasion for the rest of us to grant him leniency for his consummate stupidity and treason. So Corey, if you're watching this from beyond the grave, uh, <laughs> I hate to break it to you buddy, but this is how the world's gonna remember you. You know, it's just, every time somebody clicks on this video, every time they come to the conclusion of this chapter, all they're gonna see is you getting your face pissed on by this little cartoon character. and. Here, look, I'll shake him up and down a little bit just to get a nice even coating across your your dumbass face. And now I'll just pop in a, a couple of lumps of shit to the left and right. And there we go. That is your desecrated digital memorial.
that the world's going to witness for as long as YouTube servers host this video. And uh, yeah, for any maggots who are offended by this bit, I must inform you that I'm doing a public service right now. Like, I'm just making it clear to all you retards that if this is not the way that you want humanity to remember you, then just don't be a jackass and everything should be okay. You will never see me talking like this about anyone whose life actually matters. And if you want people to talk about you like your life matters, then you should do some shit that actually contributes to the betterment of our society. And unfortunately for Corey, he did not do that, and that is why he is receiving this treatment. It's just, uh, you know, you, you get what you give, and this is what he gave. I've said a number of provocative things throughout this essay, and before I leave you, I'd just like to explain my rationale for doing so and clarify any lingering concerns that you may have about my views. The acerbic ass tone that I've taken here, and that I'm very likely going to continue taking throughout the rest of my upcoming long and illustrious career, is the product of a revelation that I had when reading about Mitt Romney's time in the Senate. Apparently when Romney was considering running for the Senate in 2017, he made a pros and cons list on his iPad, and at the top of the list, he wrote the following line from Yeats, which reads, The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I don't think I've ever read a string of words that's done a more eloquent job of highlighting the folly behind so much of our social dysfunction. We are mired in a culture where the only people who speak with a confidence that should be reserved for the intelligent and well-intentioned are the retarded and malevolent. Whether it's leftists who insist that America is irredeemably flawed, or maggots who profess patriotism while preaching sedition, there's a heartbreaking paucity of adults in the room who are willing to tell those little shits to shut the fuck up and show some respect, even when they have every conceivable justification to do so. While the reasons for this reluctance are understandable on a personal level, they're totally indefensible when universalized. If every time you have an encounter with evil, you decide to let it pass unmolested because you're too lazy or cowardly to kill it, then perhaps it's possible for you to live a life where you're never forced to face the costs of your impotence. But if everyone were to follow in your bitch-ass footsteps, then evil would win, with quite literally no contest. The way to assimilate this fact into your decision making isn't to say, alright, well, I guess I'll fight evil on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I'll let all the people who are much more heroic and competent than me take care of it the rest of the week. The proper attitude to take is to act as if there's no one else who can get the job done, and fight till you're down to your last breath. Fight evil every time it rears its ugly head, and fight it even when you're bound to lose so that you don't leave any onlookers with an ambiguous impression of what's right and what's wrong. On that note, I stand by my antipathy for maggots and the terms in which I've expressed it. I make no apology for hating idiots and assholes who are destroying the country with their lies. In spite of this burning hatred, I would rather kill these fuckers with my words than my hands. And here I'll leave you with one last distinction that should assuage any concerns you may have about me being a murder psychopath which is the distinction between their physical and mental safety. When it comes to ensuring a maggot's physical safety, I want to spare no expense. Everywhere they go, whether they're in a house of worship or at a rally or some public forum, I want them to feel as physically safe and sheltered from the forces of nature as an unborn child resting in its mother's womb. And you know when I say this shit, people, people get grossed out. They'll come up to me and they say, Bro, you're going a little overboard with the maternal imagery and it's kind of creeping us the fuck out. Like, and chill with that shit. And I gotta be like, no, nah, man. I, I think I'm, I'm really onto something here. I, I really do believe that all human beings have an inalienable right to feel physically safe from the moment they come into this world to the moment they leave it. Okay? And seeing as how maggots are still human beings, I don't exclude them from that feeling of magnanimity and loving kindness. But when it comes to their mental safety, I'm a different beast entirely. I want them to suffer and feel real and crippling anxiety for as long as they hold to their retarded ideas. I want it to be commonly understood that these are not moral actors with feelings and emotions that are worth caring about. Every social interaction between us and them should be replete with the condescension and paternalism that we typically reserve for neurodivergent children, but with none of the accompanying warmth and compassion. Moreover, they should be made to feel like there's something deeply malformed about who they are, until they feel the same kind of shame that makes a fat hole lose 200 pounds in a year. Matter of fact, 
We should invent a whole new form of bullying that's so much more corrosive to one's self-esteem than fat shaming or any other similar instrument of social pressure. Because instead of demeaning you for superficial characteristics like your weight or height or fashion sense, it demeans you for your most essential qualities. Things like your personality, your conception of good and evil, and your most deeply held values. You know what else I want to see in conjunction with this new form of socially acceptable savagery? I want to see a flourishing economy of informational pimps, okay, who, whose full-time job, just 24-7, 365 days a year, they just go from room to room and smack a bitch up, okay? Every time she starts talking crazy, give that bitch a little rhetorical knuckle sandwich, okay? That, that's what I want to see. And on this point, I think it's only decent to give Destiny his flowers for carving out the space for this new and burgeoning industry. Not that for the last year, two or more, people have been calling for action against any Republican who agrees with Donald Trump and that uh, we should put him in the bullseye. That's totally normal and acceptable, according to you, because he delayed his acting on January 6th. Just want to make sure we're 100 percent clear here. You know, some people, they like they'll eat like the whole Oreo and then other times they twist them and then they like eat the frosting first because everybody has like their own process. I'm curious for you, do you like suck out like the blue parts of the Tide Pods first or do you eat the whole thing in one bite when you're chowing down on them every night? I've, I've got to know. You know, is I it like the whole Tide Pod or do you do it part things? by part? Do you put out like 10 of them and eat the white part like in, in, in all 10 of them and then eat the rest of it? Or what a, what a retarded you know, summary of everything that I like said. You, yeah, you sound like a extra really in my cousin Vinny, okay? Thanks for the input, okay? I'm done. I'm good. I'm out. That was perfect. Okay, and perfectly emblematic of the kind of world that I want to live in. I want to live in the kind of world where ignorant, illiterate, Tide Pod for a midnight snack eating bitches get shit on. Okay, they get shit on and laughed at and reminded of their place. I want to live in the kind of world where stupidity and shamelessness and sanctimony are not viewed as valuable assets when it comes to running a profitable media enterprise. I want to live in the kind of world where every man, woman, and child is mindful of the principle of discrimination that J. Cole explained at the end of applying pressure. That's why I gotta flex sometimes, cause niggas just try to act like you just not that motherfucking nigga. Like, like you just really don't do it how you do it. Like, niggas really try to act like you don't do what you do. Nigga, look, you dead in your face and really act like you don't do it to the level that you do it. That's why sometimes you gotta come through and just do it at the level that you do it in front of every nigga face so they know the difference between you, the real niggas, and the motherfucking fraudulent niggas, man. Don't never get it fucked up. If a nigga can't do it like you do it, sometimes you gotta do it in front of his fucking face so he'll know forever. Damn, that nigga did it how I always wanted to do it and I'll never be able to do it like that. Bitch, it's a difference. Bitch, it's a difference indeed. And that's all I've been trying to say throughout this essay. Bro, the fact that this election is even close, that, th that there even exists a group of people in our country who can't spot the difference between an insurrectionist and a stateswoman, a criminal and a prosecutor, and a clown and a professional, is a damning indictment of our collective psychology. It's like we're living in a country where half of the electorate can't tell the difference between black and white. Actually, it's worse than that. You know what it's like? It's like, it's like one in every two Americans goes to the bathroom with a fork and a knife and to the dinner table with a roll of toilet paper because they can't tell the difference between their food and their shit. And you know what's the most tragic thing about this inflection point in history? This fork in the road between freedom and tyranny? We are using the rights and privileges that we take for granted to entertain the possibility of voluntarily disposing of them. Let that soak for a second, okay? Think of just how reprehensibly blind a person has to be to humor this kind of lunacy. It's like scoring an own goal from the other end of the fucking field. There are people on earth today who would risk their own lives to acquire and promptly take the lives of others to defend the same rights and privileges that we feel so entitled to. Women in Afghanistan, victims of gang violence in Mexico, internally displaced persons in Sudan, these people want nothing more than to live in a country that values the rule of law, the peaceful transfer of power, the ability to choose your own leaders and representatives, the freedom to express yourself with virtually no limits, and the chance to make an honest living by contributing to an economy that doesn't give a fuck who you know, and only cares that you're competent enough to solve its problems. And through no fault of their own, they have been ensnared in a circumstance where those blessings are nowhere to be found. But in the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we face no impediments to speaking in defense of those sweet blessings, we somehow feel it appropriate to allow the most cowardly and selfish among us 
to defile them with impunity. And when one of those defilers dies, we express our remorse for his death as if refusing to do so would be a betrayal of our values, without even realizing what a shocking inversion of our values such a gesture would be. We have grown so decadent in our dim-wittedness that we think refusing to honor the memory of a secessionist is an affront to basic human decency. To endorse this view is of necessity to say that the Unionist belief in the justice of their cause was mistaken. It is to say that when they were killing their former brothers in arms, they were wrong, and that they should repent for their sins. They were wrong to believe that the regime of liberty that the Founding Fathers fought to establish will not be put in jeopardy by the ambitions of traitors, just as we are wrong to believe today that we can mock the maggots who follow in those traitors' footsteps. This style of moral analysis is nothing but a repugnant insult to the legacy of those who died to protect our Union, and by employing it to scare us into showing contrition, the new Confederates are stealing the valor of our fallen to embellish the sycophancy of theirs. Our heroes fought to preserve a government of laws, not of men. Their heroes fight to put one man above the law. Our heroes fought to usher in a new birth of freedom. Their heroes fight to facilitate a new reign of tyranny. Our heroes fought to protect our right to self-governance. Their heroes fight to abridge it. And at this point, the only question I have for you is are you going to let them? Are you going to let these bastards assert that their dead exist on the same moral continuum as ours? Are you going to let these freeloading fucks piss on the graves of our fallen without paying a price for that infraction? Are you going to let them live another day and sleep another night without fearing the wrath of our recompense? If your answer to that question is no, then I'm going to ask you to stop talking like a little bitch and start talking with some conviction. And if your answer to that question is yes, then I thank you for your candor and hope that your destruction will be as painful for you as it will be pleasurable for me. Thank you for your time. Hey, 30 millions later, no defense watching. Auntie on my telegram, like, be cautious. I be hanging out at Thames, I be on Stockton. I don't do it for the ground, I do it for Compton. I'm willing to die for the shit, nigga. I take your fucking life for the shit, nigga. We ain't going back to broke, family selling dope. That's why you many ass rap niggas better know. If I gotta slap a pussy ass nigga, I'ma make it look sexy. If I gotta go hard on the bitch, I'ma make it look sexy I pull up, hop out, air out, made it look sexy They won't take me out my element, nah, take me out my element